Sydney in Australia. Tara is an expert in all things radio transients um, and is also the co-founder and chief operating officer at Grok Learning, which is this really fantastic um, organization that is teaching students all across Australia about computer science and programming skills. So if you're interested in that, you should definitely talk to Tara because she's a total expert. Uh, on the research side, Tara mostly works with, as I said, radio transients and co-leads projects both on the Murchison Wide Field Array and the Australian SPA Pathfinder. Um, and today we'll be mostly hearing just about radio follow-up of gravitational wave events, including GW 1708 and results from MIGOS 03. Right. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so this is my first time in Canada, so I'm very happy to be visiting and, and talking to you all. Um, so I lead the radio transients group at the University of Sydney. I'm going to mainly talk about radio follow-up of gravitational wave events, but I've got a bit of stuff about the more general radio transients work we do at the end. Um, I'm here visiting um, Brian Gainsler at the Dunlap Institute for the next two weeks. So if anyone wants to chat about any of these different projects, or about starting a company. Yeah, the, um, well, I'm happy to discuss that as well if like, you're a student and you're considering career options or whatever. Um, so I'm giving this talk on behalf of a whole bunch of collaborators, uh, David Kaplan at the University of Wisconsin, um, and then um, some Australians, including my students, Dougal Doby, um, Ziten Wang, and postdoc Adam Stewart, and some CSIRO, CSIRO people, um, and others. Um, we've also got collaborations with the Osgrav Center of Excellence in Australia, the Growth Collaboration in the US, Caltech, um, Jaguar, and a bunch of other collaborations. So the idea of this talk is to cover what the, I know that this is a mainly theoretical group. I'm very much an observational radio astronomer. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what we can learn about uh, neutron star mergers from um, radio astronomy. So what radio astronomy, I guess, contributes to the broader picture. So I'll start by talking about what we learned from GW 1708-17 and then talk about our current observing plans and, and future observing plans for the next uh, LIGO runs. So obviously, with uh, so I'm sure that all of you have heard talks already now on 1708-17. So I decided to not give the whole kind of general background. I know some of you in the audience are way more expert on this than I am, but others, maybe there's some new students where you haven't heard the whole story. So I'll give a very brief background. Um, there's obviously a lot we can learn about these events just from the gravitational waves alone. So as the event evolves, as you're looking at those last um, thousand periods as you spiral in, you get a change in what information you get from the gravitational waves themselves. So at early times, the gravitational wave signal is driven primarily by the component masses of the two objects in the system. But as the orbit shrinks and the gravitational frequency, the gravitational wave frequency grows, you get an increasing influence by the general relativistic effects. And so you can use this to, um, you know, to test various aspects of GR. As the orbital separation approaches the size of the two bodies, um, you end up with the internal structure of the neutron stars becoming important. And so again, you get a different like, phase in, of information um, from the gravitational waves. But then um, one of the things, I mean, the most exciting thing for astronomers about 1708-17 is that, of course, it was the first LIGO event that was not just a black hole merger, and so one from which we expected to get electromagnetic radiation. So why is the electromagnetic uh, follow-up important um, in addition to the gravitational waves? So the three main things that EM, in conjunction with gravitational waves, lets you do. The first thing is that many of these events, as you know, are very poorly localized. So by poorly localized, we mean up to thousands of square degrees. Um, the best, of which 1708-17 is one of them, um, is about 30 square degrees. So this is really large areas compared to almost all other um, astronomical things we study. So the uncertainty there means that for most of those, um, for all of the black hole mergers, of course, and for most of the other events, we have uh, we don't have any identification of where the event actually occurred. So we know a lot about its properties, um, of the detailed properties of the merger, but we don't know anything about the environment or the host. And so the first thing that EM lets you do is localize that event. And obviously, in the case of 1708-17, it was localized to this uh, nearby galaxy, NGC 4993. 
And the strategy that was uh, taken to, to make that localization was to look at all of the galaxies in the um, localization volume um, of LIGO and, and basically just observe all of them um, with optical and other telescopes. Um, so that's the first role of EM um, observations of gravitational wave events is localization. The second aspect that's um, important, but I won't be talking about in this talk, is that it's the combination of um, electromagnetic radiation and gravitational waves that lets you test some of the aspects of fundamental physics that uh, you can't get just from black hole mergers alone. Um, and the most important of these is that, um, of course, this established that essentially uh, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light to within a factor of 10 to the 15. So um, this is uh, the kind of, um, I guess, to just the point to say that it's not just about astronomy, it's also about physics combining the EM and gravitational waves. From my point of view as an astronomer, the most interesting thing is that the electromagnetic radiation allows us to understand the astrophysical event that's going on with these neutron star mergers. And so this has combined a whole bunch of areas of astronomy. Um, so previously, the only um, black holes that we'd observed directly, or uh, the only stellar mass black holes that we'd observed directly, were via X-ray binary systems, which are all the purple dots on this um, diagram. Um, the y-axis is just solar masses and the x-axis is meaningless. Um, uh, the blue um, pairs were the black hole mergers from the LIGO run, uh, the first LIGO runs, and then the um, yellow were the neutron stars that we already know about. And of course, we only know the detailed properties of neutron star systems if we have a binary as well. Um, so, the, so this brought together a whole bunch of existing areas of astronomy, x-ray binaries, neutron stars, um, and, uh, and others to sort of give us the first picture of what was actually happening in the neutron star mergers. And that's what I was going to talk about today is what radio contributes to that. So for those of you that are new to this um, and haven't heard the whole story before, just a very like two minute overview of the, all of the observations before I get into the details because it's important to understand how the different observational data fits into the bigger picture. So you have, um, of course, first the gravitational waves detected, and then 1.7 seconds later, um, gamma rays detected from this event. Um, and then it was, as you know, a worldwide campaign, um, very intensive, about 150 telescopes um, searching for possible counterparts, um, which were found at, uh, the first one found um, almost 11 hours after the event, which was the optical detection, followed by infrared, ultraviolet, and then a large gap of almost two weeks um, before X-ray and then radio emission were detected. So there's two different, from an astronomy point of view, we sort of consider that there's two different objects or events involved in this. One of them is the um, event that causes the prompt emission in gamma rays, and then also um, the X-ray and uh, radio non-thermal emission that come much later. And the other one is the optical UV, optical IR event, uh, the kilonova, um, that produces the heavy elements and so on in our process uh, nuclear synthesis. So I'm not going to talk about that event um, because I'm just going to focus on the radio emission, but um, there are other people here that are, that are expert at that side of things. So the idea of this talk is to look at what we can learn from the radio observation. So what does radio astronomy contribute to this? And so the first um, radio detection, so we, we actually started searching um, at the same time as everyone else, um, got on source, um, got in the, the, like the localization region uh, within 10 hours. And as it turns out, that that's actually quite important. The radio and X-ray non-detections are important in, in modeling what was going on in this situation. So for those of you that are not radio astronomers, um, what you see in a radio image is mostly blank sky 
almost all the objects in a radio image are um, AGN, so um, you're seeing uh, synchrotron emission from supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, and that is most of what you see in any given radio image, unless you're looking right in the galactic plane, and then you might see things like supernova remnants and occasional pulsars and stuff like that. So in this image, um, what you see is the uh, supermassive black hole at the center of NGC 4993, and then offset from that, you see the radio source that we detected at the position of um, 170817. So if I overlaid like the Hubble image on this, all of this would be stars around here, but you don't see any of that in radio because you only see the non-thermal emission. So this detection was made with the um, VLA and the Australia Telescope Compact Array telescopes. Um, and so we'd been monitoring between our two groups. We'd been monitoring every day or so since the um, uh, original event. And the first radio detection was made after 16 days or 15 days um, after the event. And so then, uh, since then, we continued to do radio monitoring with a whole range of radio telescopes. Um, and it turns out that the late time monitoring is key to doing the physical modeling um, of these events. So the goal of the um, radio monitoring is to be able to fit this light curve. And the important things that you're measuring are the peak of the light curve and then the slope of the decline, um, because both of them depend on the jet um, the viewing angle and the jet opening angle. So you can get to those physical properties of the event by modeling the um, long-term light curve. And the image on the left is just some of the um, data from the GMRT in India, the VLA in the US, and the compact array in um, Australia. And yeah, for, also for those of you that are not used to looking at radio data, it does look really messy compared to the optical images you might be used to, but you'll have to believe us that all of these are statistically significant detections, um, particularly when you combine them um, and they agree. So that was the observational work that we were doing. This just shows the combined compact array, VLA, GMRT, um, and Meerkat data, along with some of the X-ray data. Now, what that helps you do is, and I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that I'm speaking to a room of theoretical people, so feel free to uh, disagree with me or each other um, or answer each other's questions on this. I'm definitely not an expert, um, but broadly, like big, big picture um, models of what we're looking at. Uh, when we were first studying this event, um, the first question was whether this could just be a regular short gamma ray burst or a regular short gamma ray burst viewed off axis. And so in um, a classic short GRB, you expect to have, you basically have a really narrow, less than 10 degrees, usually a few degrees jet, traveling at ultra-relativistic velocities with a Lorentz factor of about 100. And so, um, obviously, short GRBs, for a long time, the, expect, you know, the hypothesized progenitors of um, short, GRBs, short GRBs were neutron star mergers. But the, um, and so, in a sense, this can explain, you know, this, this was the confirmation that at least some short GRBs can be explained by this kind of neutron star merger. But, of course, the gamma ray luminosity of this event was about four orders of magnitude less than a typical short GRB. So if this was just an extremely weak short GRB, then um, the successful like, observation of this jet would require a very, very low density of material, a very, very low ejector mass of less than 3 times 10 to the minus 6 solar masses. And so that's contradicted directly by the UV, optical, and infrared observations um, of about 0.05 solar masses at the time. And those numbers have probably been um, updated. So this was straight away um, inconsistent just by the UV and optical observations. Now, the sort of alternate to that scenario was that we were observing a classic short GRB, but observed off-axis by only a few degrees. Um, and so um, in this case, though, after the um, uh, external shot shock decelerates about a day after the event, you expect a bright afterglow across all wave bands. And so the fact that we were observing in X-ray and radio right from day one, but there were no detections, constrained this um, situation to being an extremely low density and, and basically was inconsistent with the observation. So UV, optical, and IR ruled out the first scenario. 
um, radio and x-ray ruled out the second scenario. And so we were left with two, at a broad level, two, two kind of scenarios. Um, in the literature, this is sometimes described as a cocoon and sometimes it's described as a structured jet. It just, either, either um, terminology just basically means a jet with something else going on, not just a pure uh, gamma ray burst jet. So the, in these two scenarios, um, both of them involve launching an ultra-relativistic jet um, with a high Lorentz factor, um, but that jet interacts with some of the neutron-rich material that's been ejected during the merger, and that gives rise to a cocoon of material that's going at mildly relativistic speeds, um, moving in our direction. And so, in those two different scenarios, either the jet uh, could break out of that cocoon of material, or it doesn't break out, and so in the first situation, you see the radio emission from the um, forward shock itself, and in the second uh, situation, you see the radio emission from that jet afterglow. And so just qualitatively, they're the two different scenarios that um, the community was trying to distinguish between. So the modeling of the light curve alone, the combined radio and x-ray light curves, was not enough to distinguish between them. So there was a whole range of um, hydrodynamical and semi-analytic models um, that were applied, but they were consistent with both scenarios, basically. They, they weren't, uh, we weren't able to distinguish between them. And so the next step um, where we got very lucky was looking at uh, VLBI imaging. So um, most of you know I, that VLBI imaging is when you combine, so you're still using interferometry, but over really massive distances, different telescopes together, so you can get down to milli arc second resolution. And so the idea with um, VLBI imaging is that it could allow you to distinguish between um, the uh, breaking out of the cocoon scenario and being choked by the cocoon scenario in this way. So if you have the radio emission dominated by the cocoon, which is moving in a more isotropic way, then you might expect, if your resolution is high enough, that the source would expand over um, a period of time after the event. Um, but it probably won't change position, um, because you're still, the centroid should still be in the same place. If, on the other hand, your radio emission is primarily coming from the jet, then as the jet expands, you might be able to see the position, uh, uh, the effective position of the radio emission change, but not necessarily any expansion. So these are the two observations that um, my colleagues, uh, Kunal Mooley and Adam Della, took um, with the VLBA. You have uh, in both, the, this is the resolution of the two observations. So black is 75 days after the merger, and red is 230 days after the merger. Um, and so both of these are consistent with the resolution, the telescope response. And so there's no expansion observed, which either means there was no expansion or, you know, it was at a level that wasn't detectable by these observations. But there was a significant difference in the position. Um, so this ruled out um, an isotropic ejector and, and indicated that at least at late time, the radio emission was likely dominated by the jet. And so what you're seeing is an afterglow expanding. Um, but, of course, that doesn't mean that at early times it's not a combination of both and so on, and this is obviously only one event. Um, so that was one um, interesting result and, you know, very clear way that um, we could help distinguish between the models. The other interesting thing about the VLBI results is that it also helped to constrain the independent measure of the Hubble constant. So as most of you probably know, um, the gravitational wave strain provides a, a way of um, measuring the Hubble constant that's independent of our usual uh, cosmic distance ladder. So we don't need to be, um, uh, so we can, we, can, we can measure it in a way that's, I guess, independent of the existing two methods of measuring it, which are your supernova experiment and your CMB. And so um, the problem with using the gravitational wave strain, though, is that the um, main uncertainty in it is due to um, a distance inclination degeneracy. So um, the VLBI allows you to constrain the inclination uh, more and so help break that degeneracy. And so you can reduce your um, uncertainty by a factor of a few in measuring the Hubble constant. So I think to get that this at the moment, um, the gravitational wave uh, measurement plus the VLBI 
um, gets you the blue curve. And what we would need is about 10 or so sources like GW170817 to get the uncertainties on that measurement down to 2 or 3%, which are similar to your other methods of measuring the Hubble constant. Now, of course, it's probably likely that we would get, I think just with black hole mergers, you need about 100 or so events to get down to a similar uncertainty. So it's likely that will happen first. Well, we didn't know that at the beginning of 03, but now we've had almost all of 03. And you know, not to spoil the rest of my talk, but I'm sure you know already, there have been no more EM detections um, so far. Um, I think we'll get to 100 black hole mergers before we get to 10 um, well-constrained EM you know, neutron star mergers. Um, but still, that's an interesting other uh, method for measuring the Hubble constant. So um, the next uh, part of my talk is what we're doing in 03. So that's the story of like, what we learn from radio, why, what role radio plays in understanding um, neutron star mergers. And um, the bigger picture questions that radio allows us to ask is sort of how much energy do neutron star mergers release? Um, what fraction of, um, well, I guess you could either think of it as um, what the opening angle of the mergers are or um, what fraction of them have relativistic jets. Um, and then trying to understand the full population if we can look at the more isotropic emission, um, not only the things that happen to be aligned with um, our line of sight. So LIGO 03, as you know, um, is now almost over. So um, the original talk I, I gave on this at the beginning of 03, we were kind of more full of hope that we would get some more um, objects like 170817. Now we've only got a few months left, and so we're running out of time um, to detect something. But the sensitivity improvement of LIGO 03 was about, um, thought about a factor of two in detection rate. And so we have seen, um, we have seen that in, the, in terms of the number of objects we've seen, but none of them have had really the great combination of localization and position that 170817 had. So that just seemed to be quite a, um, a preferential event in terms of all the conditions being right for us to get good observations at all different wavelengths. So our radio program for currently, for O3, um, <coughs> has got three main telescopes in Australia. These are all um, Australian telescopes. The first one, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, um, is located in Narrabri in western New South Wales. Um, and so the idea with that is to do the same kind of observations we did in O2, which is targeted observations if there's an electromagnetic counterpart identified at other wavelengths. So this would be like a radio follow-up program. Um, we haven't triggered it yet because uh, we haven't had any EM counterparts, so that's a bit disappointing. Um, the second aspect of it is using a new telescope that you might not have heard of called the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. So the Square Kilometre Array, I'm sure you know, is the next generation of radio telescopes, um, billion dollar international project, um, and a bunch of telescopes around the world were built to help test various aspects of this. Um, uh, in terms of the technology and engineering and so on, and ASCAP is one of those. So ASCAP's located in Western Australia, um, in the middle of the desert, uh, great um, RFI conditions, um, and one of the main advantages of ASCAP, it's designed to be a survey telescope, is it has a very wide field of view, so 30 square degrees. And that means that we can actually use that to do untargeted observations of the LIGO error circle. Um, we can cover, for example, 1708.17 in only uh, a couple of, of, of pointings as opposed to almost every other radio telescope. The only radio telescope that really does better than that is the MWA um, and uh, LOFAR, um, where you have, this is very low frequency, so the Compact Array and ASCAP are both sort of gigahertz range telescopes. Um, the MWA is low frequency, so hundreds of megahertz. Um, at hundreds of megahertz, you don't really expect strong afterglows from GRBs. But the advantage of the MWA is a thousand square degrees field of view, and so and we can also do automatic triggering, so we can get on source um, within seconds 
um, with the MWA, and we've done that successfully for the first time in this observing run. Um, uh, managed to get on, you know, like cover the most of the error region within about 10 or 20 seconds of um, getting the uh, uh, um, trigger. So they're the three telescopes that we're using. Um, for I just thought since. Um, I'm coming from Australia. I should show you some pictures of Australia with our telescopes. So these two, MWA and ASCAP, they're located in the same place uh, in the Murchison Shire in Western Australia. It's a few hundred kilometres northeast of Geraldton, which is a few hundred kilometres north of Perth. And the population density is about one person per square kilometre. Um, so there's almost no radio frequency interference. It's in a radio protected quiet zone. Um, Sorry? Is that where the Murchison Um, I don't know. Um, I'd have to look that up. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah. Um, so this is the compact array in, in uh, Narrabri. There's pretty good RFI properties there. But when you get the data from ASCAP for the first time, which we're just starting to explore, it's unbelievable how much better it is than any other radio telescope I've ever worked on. Um, completely clear skies out there, um, or computer and mobile phone free skies out there. Um, so one of the, so the, the aspects of our program it, during this observing run, um, the first thing is that ASCAP is good for source localization. So all of the other radio programs that we've got are basically dependent on detecting a counterpart at other wavelengths first, and then following it up with a um, fairly you know, focused pointing. Um, but with ASCAP, because we can uh, see 30 square degrees at the same time, um, then we can use ASCAP when there's no EM counterpart, um, or when the localization is poor, or just when it's um, too far south for other telescopes. So one of the interesting prospects for radio, because uh, it's generally sort of thought of that radio comes last, you know, because in terms of um, the emission, usually peaks with uh, a higher frequency and then declines, um, and typically because of the capabilities of the radio telescopes as well. They've been used typically in a follow-up capacity for um, GRBs, for the whole sort of history of GRB follow-up. So this is the first time with a telescope like ASCAP that you could actually do radio first, and we have done that uh, once, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so the second aspect of our program in this observing run is to look at um, the, the, what we've already been doing, radio monitoring, if there's already a counterpart, I won't discuss it more because basically there haven't been any so far um, that we can follow up. But um, we've been doing some projections for um, the capabilities of all different radio telescopes, including the SKA, in terms of how far we can detect, um, how far we can detect sources in the radio dependent on inclination angle and the density of the interstellar medium. Um, because one of the questions is whether I often get asked is whether there are any sources, that, whether there are any scenarios in which we can detect radio emission from a neutron star merger where we can't detect optical emission. And so one of the answers to that question is that there are just due to observational issues, for example, um, just uh, the source being too close to the sun or not being up at the right time or, you know, that kind of um, uh, issue, but also there are um, real astrophysical issues, um, whether it's dust obscuration or even um, depending on exactly the density of the interstellar medium and the energy of the event, um, situations where we may be able to detect radio without optical and um, IR emission. So that's an interesting question for future instruments. The third aspect of our program and plans is looking at VLBI for detecting expansion or um, superluminal motion, looking at the change of position. One of the ways we can do that is VLBI, which I already explained. The other one is looking at um, scintillation as a mechanism for, look, uh, for detecting expansion. And this is something that's been done before with GRBs. The conditions have to be just right. But um, because you can only uh, detect scintillation when an object is very compact, um, as an object expands, um, you could see, if you can detect scintillation, you can see it switch off. And so you can get an estimate of the um, uh, spatial size um, through the 
um, change in scintillation properties. So that's another thing that we've been doing some modeling for to see what scenarios we could um, detect that under. The final aspect is, um, which is something that I'm really interested in uh, myself, is looking at unbiased or untargeted surveys for orphan afterglows. So this has been an aim in radio astronomy for uh, GRB observations for a long time, long GRBs, um, and now, of course, um, bringing in the gravitational wave connection just extends this idea to short GRBs. So the idea here is that all GRB follow-up so far is based on um, the uh, jet from the GRB being in the line of sight or you know, um, a, a few degrees off axis um, from our line of sight, and then following up at lower frequencies. But <clears throat> as the um, afterglow expands and you get more isotropic emission, or if there's emission from, for example, a cocoon of um, ejector material interacting with a shock, then you should be able to detect afterglows um, in the absence of higher frequency or, or um, even gamma ray um, detection. And so this uh, plot here shows that in, um, this is the ASCAP sensitivity currently, um, and this is uh, the light curve from GW170817, or part of the light curve, um, we've got more now. Um, but this shows that in principle, you could have detected um, 170817 as a, an afterglow independent of getting a higher frequency detection. So um, that's interesting for um, neutron star mergers. It's also just interesting for um, long GRBs. Um, the question I then get asked is, um, but how would you know um, that that was an afterglow? Um, how would you know that was a GRB afterglow? Um, and people that are not used to radio transients are thinking of optical transients where um, you know, there are hundreds of kind of things going off every night um, and there would be lots of false positives. One of the sort of depressing things about radio work, all our work in radio transients for the last 10 years is that we've shown that in all the legacy surveys that we've explored, the rates of radio transients are extremely low. So um, only sort of one in thousands of objects. The plus side to that is that we have very few false positives. So in a deep radio image, for example, of one of these LIGO fields, um, we might find out of the thousands of radio sources in the field that only a few of them, like less than five, are actually highly variable. And so we have very few false positive candidates in these surveys. Yes? So even if you didn't have this, uh, if you just say we don't see anything else, so if you see something, it's probably this thing. But an afterglow has a very, very well defined rise and fall. Oh, yes. Of course. So we would then, we, so yes, so after we'd made that initial um, detection of candidates, we would just follow them up with a telescope like the Compact Array and get regular observations of them over time. And then we would, yes, be able to um, identify it. So it's more a question of um, people's concern is, uh, that you may be dealing with thousands of candidates from a field, right? Whereas we'd be dealing with four or five. Um, and so then it would be very feasible to do radio, very regular radio observations with the VLA or the compact array um, to, to identify them. Yeah. So if I ask, like, for example, just looking at the time scale on this, it's on the order of hundreds of days. Yep. If you're making individual observations with these radio telescopes, how much of a chunk of a day do you need to actually be on target to make something like one of these on long time scale? Yeah, um, so it totally depends on obviously the, um, how bright the event is and, and which telescope you're talking about. But our observations range from 10 minutes to 10 hours. Okay, so like sometimes you're doing a whole day, that, a deep observation. Um, but with ASCAP, um, I mean the capability of the VLA is you know, much better for doing a targeted observation. So like ASCAP strength is that you can observe thousands of sources at the same time with pretty good sensitivity. But if you go to the VLA and you know where your source is, then you could get the same sensitivity in you know, minutes or fewer hours. So I think that that, that would be, you know, we'd just choose the, choose the right telescope for the job there. So what have we done so far in 03? This is a plot of all of the different um, uh, LIGO detection so far. The size of the circle is inversely proportional to the um, localization area. So big means well localized. 
um, and uh, small means badly localized. Um, and the colors are just the different types of events as they're classified by um, LIGO. So <coughs> the two um, that we've done radio follow-up so far, the first one was 1905-10G, which initially um, was um, a binary neutron star merger and then sadly got reclassified as terrestrial, most likely terrestrial, um, after we'd done our observations. Um, and the red one is the one that obviously everyone got excited about 1908-14, which was the first neutron star black hole merger, pretty well localized. Um, a lot of EM follow-up, um, of which we were one of them, um, and unfortunately no um, reasonable counterparts. So this is the field for 1908-14. Um, this is a single ASCAP observation, so um, 30 square degrees, all of these black dots are um, AGN, um, and um, we basically, this is a, an example where we did four epochs, 10 hours each, we get to 35 microjanskis RMS, um, which if you're a radio astronomer is pretty amazing um, for this kind of like wide field observation. Um, this was also the first time that we'd actually, because there were no EM counterparts um, at higher frequencies, um, and we did find one object in this field, so we were talking about the false positive rates, we found one object that had a 40% rise in flux between epochs one and two, so we did actually put out an alert about that, that was the first time a radio um, alert had ever gone out, I think, before any other frequency, so a little sort of um, fun for radio astronomers to say, yes, we finally like, got one ahead of everyone else for the first time ever. Um, and so, but it was a good demonstration of the capabilities of these new radio telescopes that we could do that. So unfortunately, when we actually followed this source up, um, it just shows kind of um, uh, random variability over um, a period of days. So it's probably just a low luminosity AGN. So the main um, like interlopers, the main false positives you'll get in this uh, are variable AGN, just because AGN are most of the things in any given radio image, and some of them vary. Um, so it was a bit disappointing in terms of a result, but it was um, cool to be able to at least contribute. Oh, sorry. The previous image, the x-axis is days. Yes. So we did observations over. Um, uh, There's no units. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that's actually a mistake. We should add the units to that. Um, yeah, so um, then we um, were able to at least constrain a little bit the environment of this um, merger, um, but very like, limited what we could do with a non-detection. From a more broad radio transients point of view, though, the great thing was that this was sort of a bonus transient survey. So incredibly, for those of you that are not involved in radio astronomy, Incredibly, our four observations of this LIGO field turn out to be the best um, uh, radio transient survey at high sensitivity that exists. So this plot um, shows the uh, sensitivity um, of various surveys and um, the rate of highly variable or transient surveys you expect. So at this end of the um, plot, you have um, very small field more sensitive surveys. So some of these have been done with things like studying the VLA calibrator fields that have re been repeated many times. And at this end of the plot, you have very wide field uh, surveys like uh, at very low sensitivity, like comparing um, NVSS and FIRST. So just comparing two large legacy surveys. And all of these are limits on the rate of um, transients uh, discovered in those surveys. And these dashed lines are kind of predictions from uh, Brian Metzger's models of various rates for long GRBs, magnetars, and so on. So as you can see, for most of, so for the last decade, people have been doing new surveys and exploring legacy radio surveys um, to try and uh, get closer to these predictions. Um, and uh, so far, most of them have not been very constraining. Some of the things we're working on at the moment, this is our four observations of that gravitational wave field, which is now the best survey in this sort of very sensitive space. And this is some of the um, other surveys that I'm working on at the moment, which I'll talk about um, very briefly now. So this is some work that's being done by my postdoc, Adam Stewart. So as I was alluding to before, 
only less than 1% of the sources in a radio field are highly variable. Um, so it's a very tiny uh, false positive rate. Uh, so you um, estimate the uh, rate of TDs, for example, radio TDs, for example? Um, I'm not actually sure exactly how that, I can, I can check that paper. I haven't, I haven't um, well, checked for a while. We haven't seen a lot of them, but it's because yeah. we covered it very recently. Yeah, yeah. But I think it comes from the TDE rate. I think it comes from um, projections from the TDE rate at other wavelengths, right? And then, and then looking at what kind of um, uh, uh, fraction of those might cause radio emission. So, well, if this is, well, if this is the case, then it's not because it's probably coming from a different part of the grid. It's not, it's not the same mechanism. That's good. No, no, that's right. But I think, well, firstly, I'm not, firstly, these are very, um, like broad predictions. I mean, these have been made in the absence of almost any information, as you said, for all of them, like short GRBs as well, which uh, oh, is not on this plot, is on some of my other plots. There are five like radio detections in total, you know. Um, so there are a whole bunch of these that there are almost no radio information at all. I've also put this on as if it's kind of static, but like these predictions were not in that spot before all these surveys were done. Um, well, I, you know, that's the interaction between theory and observation. I mean, they've moved down as we've done more of these surveys, right? So when I first used to do this plot 10 years ago, they were in a different spot. Um, so, um, but I have to check, I, I just have to check Metzger's paper on the TDE predictions. I can't answer that off the top of my head. Um, but they're very much, I would say these are very much just um, sort of broadly indicative. I wouldn't say that, you know, they were um, very precise predictions. So the final aspect of this um, uh, radio work that I haven't really discussed is the possibility of detecting prompt emission from uh, neutron star mergers. So one of the many hypotheses of, um, you know, prompt FRB-like emission, so fast radio burst emission, for those of you that are not up on that uh, radio terminology, um, is that there could be some connection between FRB-like emission and neutron star mergers. Um, it can't possibly explain, these, these can't possibly be the same phenomenon, the rates, the FRB rates are much higher than the neutron star merger rates, um, but it's also quite possible that FRBs are not one class of objects, as, as you know, um, and so it's possible that some FRB-like emission could be explained by something like neutron star mergers. To test that, we'd have to be able to detect that prompt radio emission. And so the limitations at the moment in doing that are firstly the um, LIGO latency itself, um, which is um, tens of seconds, and in reality, after human checking, uh, minutes. Um, and then there's the latency of the radio response. And so we do actually do automatic triggering with a bunch of our radio telescopes, including the Compact Array and the MWA, which we've recently implemented. Um, but the real key would be if we can get negative latency triggers from LIGO. And so if the, um, so the plan for 04, and it was potentially the plan for 03, but I don't think it's going to happen by April, but I, I can't speak for LIGO. Um, the plan for 04 is that if um, they can send out a trigger at the beginning of an event, um, then it may be possible, depending on how long the event is and how fast they can get that negative latency pipeline, that you could get the alert up to sort of 30 seconds before the merger actually happens. In that kind of situation, and if we have completely optimal um, uh, uh, situation with our radio telescope, so with a, with a field of view like ASCAP, um, if we happen to be pointing in a roughly similar enough direction, then we could get on source before the event occurs. And that's just another thing that we're exploring for 04. We basically have another year and a half now to um, try and get that working. Yeah. So for, for 04 at the very least, would that be more, say, for the player or for the um, binary neutron star or for the like, total length or the four? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's for that 30 seconds second before, is that probably only going to be for these things with the signal where you can Yeah. For this to work, it's sort of like a once, I think this is a very unlikely, but would be extremely informative if we could do it. It requires so many things to come together. It requires the signal, the actual event itself to be long enough. 
It requires the LIGO negative latency pipeline to be quick enough. It requires the radio telescope response to be fast enough. And it, that includes, it requires us to be on sky and in roughly the same area um, to get on source fast enough. And then it requires some detectable FRB event. So are you, so you're talking here, you have the sleep time distribution. Yep. So presumably decrease the sleep time necessary if you already bias your pointings towards the lobes of the antenna response. Yeah, that's right. So that's the kind of um, little simulations we're trying to do at the moment, is what is the optimal um, situation for our telescope where should it go? Because the other downside of these negative latency triggers, as I'm sure you know, is that they will be very poorly localized compared to the um, current ones. So we basically just have to get to, like, say, the highest probability point as it is in the negative latency trigger and hope that that works. No, no, but yep. I'm starting, you can start in the right place, too, to decrease your, the, the amount of time you have to slew. How do you start in the right place? Well, well it's a statistical argument, but essentially, right? Like it has the, it's oh, the antenna, it's oh. Antenna factor. So if you're pointing in the, the, the lobes, just in your blind survey, when you're running MWA, yes. you're pointing in the lobes beforehand, then you basically decrease the distance you have to slew to when you get a little bit So then you get into politics because we don't have... Um, we don't have control over, we, we, like me personally, I'm not running on the MWA or ASCAP all the time. So if I was, then I could do that. But in reality, there'll be other programs running. And in fact, with MWA, it's not an issue. With ASCAP, it's already kind of a bit controversial to request any kind of rapid response because it was not designed to do that, um, which is actually why we're doing this modeling now to see if it's possible. Yep. Is it maybe possible to get a localization uh, gone tools before 30 to 60 seconds. Because I, if I remember correctly, the paper stated that there are lots of teachers that we see while they are matched with them. And it's only when they get the high frequency range that they are able to get the masses and then they fit in the pipeline to get yeah. the information and then they form the localization. So yeah. is there any way possible to get localization before 30 to 60 seconds? Do you want to? Yeah. Surabhi Sashtev is a post-diagnostic one of the papers, too, which is like the next iteration of this GSTLL thing. Like, and yeah, I mean, it's much worse as far as uh, you can do order a thousand square degrees, which is a lot better. Right. Yeah. So MWA could do a thousand square degrees. That would be okay. ASCAP, obviously, we can only do 30. But we can do more than that with fly's eye mode. So one of the, the FRB observations on ASCAP have been using fly's eye mode pointing every antenna individually in different directions. So you get less sensitivity but cover more of the sky. So that's the kind of mode we'd be looking at using if we were doing um, these kind of observations. Yeah. It would be pushing, it would be pushing everything to the limit though to get that to work, like every aspect of it. Um, so I think I meant to finish at four, is that right? Yes, okay. I, I don't think I need to go over time. I can just very quickly show you. I'm not going to talk about these projects. I just want to put up some slides in case anyone wants to come and chat to me in the next two weeks. Um, so one of the uh, main projects I run at the moment is the ASCAP Variables and Slow Transients Survey. Um, so this is an untargeted survey of the sky at about a gigahertz, um, looking for all kinds of uh, phenomena that are variable in radio frequencies from uh, propagation effects due to the ISM, like uh, extreme scattering events, um, through to explosive events like gamma ray bursts and supernova, um, through to magnetospheric e um, uh, effects on uh, stars, um, possibly even exoplanets, uh, magnetars, and so on. So anything uh, related to these topics, we should be able to do with our survey. Our pilot survey is underway right now. We have 100 hours this year. Um, ASCAP is working. This is the first year that we've been, last year was the first year we've been operating ASCAP at its um, uh, design specs. Um, the data's amazing. Uh, we'll be publicly releasing it um, as soon as it's scientific quality. That's the, the deal that um, CSRO has with all of the science teams. So if you're interested in getting involved in any of these, um, projects about variability, talk to me. So this is the pilot survey footprint, the, the aqua um, is our pilot survey. But once the full survey starts in a year or so, it will just be the whole um, 
uh, sky up to um, 30 degrees, we can plus 30 that we can reach. Um, there's also a whole bunch of other projects working on ASCAP. So if you're interested in general continuum surveys, H1 surveys, emission or absorption, um, then I'm happy to put you in contact with the right people. Uh, some of the results from ASCAP um, so far from our VAST survey. Um, this is uh, an example of dynamic spectrum showing um, periodic emission from UV SETI. So if you are familiar with radio astronomy, you'll know that it's completely um, uh, freakishly good to see data that's covering such a wide frequency range um, continuously uh, with time so that we can see the incredible detail um, in these uh, pulses of emission. So um, if you're interested in kind of um, pulsar-like or flare star emission, this is the very first observations we've done. Obviously UV SETI, very well-known source that we've done as a test. Um, but this just shows the kind of potential uh, full polarization um, parameters. Um, so the potential of ASCAP to do this kind of observation. I'm just doing a little like advert for ASCAP now. Um, in our observations of Proxima Sen, um, again, looking at circular <laughs> polarization this time, we just discovered a new pulsar there that was the only source in the field that was circularly polarized. Um, the data, this is this is because um, most sources don't emit circularly polarized radio emission. It's completely clean. You can see there's just absolutely nothing there um, except our tiny source here. Um, so the data quality is really amazing. Um, and this stuff is just jumping out. I'm not exaggerating to say that like, we create these images, look at them, and stuff is jumping out straight away. So if you're interested in kind of getting access to any of this data, let me know. Um, and then one of the other projects we're working on at the moment is, is looking at this, this survey called the Rapid ASCAP Continuum Survey, which is like a test project that CSRO has done, which happens to be the best now gigahertz continuum radio survey of the um, sky, so better than um, NVSS and SUMS, our two traditional reference surveys that we use. Again, um, circularly polarized sources jumping out, um, tens of stars that have never been detected in radio, supernova jumping out. Um, so lots of things um, here that are that f people interested in from a range of different science areas. So I'll finish there. Um, I basically just, um, the idea was to give you a picture of what radio astronomy is doing in the gravitational wave event follow-up space. Unfortunately, we haven't made any detections so far, um, but we have demonstrated um, the sort of importance of um, what we can bring to the picture and the capabilities of our new telescopes um, to do this stuff. So if you're interested in chatting over the next two weeks, I'm around in room 112 in the Dunlap Institute building. Um, so happy to chat if you want. Thank you.